I should be there long.
Welcome, graduates, parents, distinguished guests, and the entire Fordham family assembled here this afternoon or watching our live stream. I am Associate Dean Nestor Davidson, and it is my honor to declare the Fordham University School of Law's 110th Diploma Ceremony in session. And it is lovely to be here at Rose Hill, and I think actually there's going to be a, a pickup game in here afterwards, so stick around. So if everyone would please stand, please join me in welcoming Michael McCarthy of the Society of Jesus, our Vice President for Mission Integration and Planning, to give our invocation. Let us bow our heads and pray. O source of all justice and right, the ancient book of Psalms begins by proclaiming the great blessing of the law. Blessed is the one, the psalmist says, who do does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the company of scoffers. Rather, the law of the Lord is his joy. And on this law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted near streams of water that yields its fruit in due season, whose leaves never wither, and everything he does prospers. Grant us, then, such prosperity. Give us, then, the grace to find joy in the law day and night. Focus our hearts on the cause of righteousness and heal our hearts of self-righteousness. Turn us again and again to the common good and save us from the temptations of selfish gain. Strengthen us to advocate on behalf of those most vulnerable and spare us the self-indulgence of licking our own wounds. For those who have completed their course of studies, give them joy and a sense of purpose to seek justice in all they do. For members of their families, give them a sense of pride proper to this moment. And for members of their faculty, deepen in them a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment as they see today the fruits of their calling. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Please remain standing as I welcome three people who show how truly multi-talented Fordham Law students are. To lead us in our national anthem, please welcome Maria Brusco, Alessandra Rose Johnson, and Bethany Smith.
so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still Please be seated. Incredible, incredible. Wow. It's very tempting at a moment like that just to say play ball, but. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce someone who has brought incredible energy, vision, and a deep sense of community to our law school in his first two years as our dean, Dean Matthew Diller. Thank you, Mr. Grand Marshal, Father McShane, Dr. Friedman, Father McCarthy, members of the University Administration and Board of Trustees, esteemed colleagues and faculty members, Attorney General Schneiderman, families and friends of the graduates, and most importantly, members of the Fordham University School of Law graduating class of 2017. I join Dean Davidson in welcoming all of you to Fordham Law's 110th Diploma Ceremony. It is said in many cultures that a rainy wedding day portends a productive and prosperous marriage. I believe the adage holds true for commencements and graduations as well. So many good things will come your way. Graduates, Today is your day. We celebrate your achievements, your accomplishments, everything that you have done at Fordham Law School that has led you to this moment. You have learned important legal skills in the classroom. You have competed on teams, moot court, trial advocacy, and dispute resolution. You have written for law journals. You have sought out meaningful public service and pro bono work. You have won awards, secured clerkships, completed service projects, and earned fellowships. We wholeheartedly cheer your outstanding work during these years at Fordham Law. But just as we celebrate, we must also bear in mind the import, the responsibility of your chosen profession. Being a lawyer is serious business, and we live in serious times. We are at a critical moment in our history. Many people are asking basic questions about our Constitution. Individuals are debating the meaning of constitutional clauses that just last year few people had even heard of. Our nation is so sharply divided that people of differing opinions and viewpoints are struggling to make eye contact, let alone to speak to one another. The challenges that we face throw into relief two fundamental truths, the absolute indispensability of the rule of law and the role of lawyers in ensuring that the rule of law is not simply an ideal, but a reality. The rule of law forms the bedrock of our liberal democracy. The rule of law affirms that all of us must play by the same rule book, that all of us have equal rights and that the authority vested in our government must be exercised according to constitutional and democratic principles. 
for the rule of law to work, people must have faith in public institutions. When people lose faith, they surrender trust. They then begin to ask themselves, if others don't play by the rules, why should I? As lawyers, you are the stewards of the rule of law. You guarantee its future, and we look to you to safeguard our democracy. Standing here today, I can count 529 reasons for hope. You stand out as beacons of promise. If we are at a crossroads, then you are the signposts that will lead us in the right direction. As Fordham lawyers, you represent the best of the legal profession. And the profession needs lawyers like you, lawyers who are able to discuss difficult and challenging issues with respect and civility, who are able to bridge gaps in understanding, who are able to reach mutually beneficial resolutions of problems, lawyers who engage in reasoned discourse that draws on fundamental values of integrity, ethics, and professionalism, and lawyers who put justice and service first. Your Fordham at Law education has prepared you to practice law according to these values, to go out into the world and make an impact. There are so many opportunities for you to serve in your profession, whether you choose corporate law, intellectual property law, government service, public interest work, a small firm, a big firm. The chances for you to make a difference are manifold. Indeed, you have already begun to make a difference. A group of you in our federal tax clinic won a victory for a client in a dispute with the IRS over his retirement account. The man reached out to me after the case was settled to express his gratitude. He wrote, quote, at trial, the students performed as if they had appeared in court for years, and fortunately we prevailed. I cannot express how important it was to my family financially for this outcome. My family will be forever grateful to them. Some of you in our federal litigation clinic teamed up with others of you in our intellectual property clinic to help a local manufacturer of bath products in a trademark case that was heard in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York. You wrote papers and conducted oral arguments advocating for the manufacturer to continue to produce a particular line of her bath soaps. The manufacturer, a woman from the Rockaways in Queens, said, quote, if, the, if this product were pulled, I would have had to close my company, literally and figuratively. The team from Fordham Law saved my company. I am still in business because of the work they did. At a time when some government officials are calling for the elimination of federal uh, funding for civil legal aid to low-income Americans, you are pushing forward to help vulnerable populations get the legal representation they so badly need. You advocate for low-income tenants to preserve and defend affordable housing. You respond with compassion and guidance when immigrants are facing crises. And when an executive order limiting travel threatens the very health and well-being of, of, of the young daughter of one of your classmates, you rally to support her. Many of you participated in the Know Your Rights workshops for immigrant students and their parents at New York City high schools that were organized by professors Jennifer Gordon and, Gem and Gemma Salamene. Still others of you traveled to South Texas with the FIRIC Center for Social Justice to work with recently arrived immigrant women and children applying for asylum. These families are escaping desperate, violent circumstances in their home countries, and you are helping them to reach a safer life. In recognition of your efforts, the New York State Bar Association honored you last month with the President's Pro Bono Service Award. And as you have displayed excellence through your acts of service, so too you have distinguished yourselves through your articles and publications and your writing. One of the central missions of university of universities and law schools in particular is to cultivate deep thought, to promote the thoughtful and deliberate examination of an issue using research and evidence. And you have established this robustness of intellect through your scholarship and writing. 
In fact, one of your classmates could not attend today's graduation because of another ceremony that he's attending in Washington, D.C. at the Library of Congress, where he is receiving the Burton Award for Distinguished Legal Writing for his outstanding Law Review note. Also honored at that same ceremony will be none other than Associate Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg visited Fordham Law this past September to deliver the Robert L. Levine Lecture, and she enthralled students with her keen insights into legal practice and the judiciary. Among the important topics she addressed was gender discrimination, and she talked about her own contributions working for gender equality as a young litigator with the ACLU. Thanks to the efforts of Justice Ginsburg and other pioneering women, much progress has been made, but as Justice Ginsburg herself noted, there are still hurdles. We are proud today that almost 56% of you are adding to the ranks of powerful women attorneys and legal professionals. <laughs> Associate Justice Sonia Sotomayor also visited campus. She came just four days before Justice Ginsburg's lecture. Justice Sotomayor spoke with students about her experience as the first Latina to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court. Justice Sotomayor has been a pathbreaker on the bench, and many of you are blazing your own trails from diverse starting points. You have come from across the world, from near and far, from many cultures, speaking many different languages, but you are all part of one Fordham Law School, and we are expecting great things from you because New Yorkers do great things, and it is my studied opinion that your Fordham affiliation makes you a New Yorker if you weren't one already. Now consider some of the New Yorkers who came before you. Eric Schneiderman, who cut his teeth on the Upper West Side. Sonia Sotomayor, who grew up in the Bronxdale houses just three miles from this very spot. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose childhood was spent in Flatbush in Brooklyn. You are the inheritors of their great work, and you will do great work yourselves. You have the skills, the creativity, the ingenuity, the determination, and the judgment to affect real change. And you have the community of fellow Fordham Law alumni to support you. At Fordham Law, community is a central value. It is important not only that we support others, but also to acknowledge and appreciate this, the support that each of us has received. You have been supported by a community of people who believe in you and have nurtured your success. I'm talking, of course, about your friends and your family, those who love you and who celebrate every achievement. I would like to ask you, our graduates, to stand and to applaud the beloved members of your family and friends who have been with you every step of the way. And I say to you, graduates, on behalf of the faculty and the administration, that we thank you for making Fordham Law an inspiring place to work. Everyone at the law school marvels at your talent and energy. You remind us every day through your own efforts that we work in the service of others. We are in awe of all that you have achieved, and we cannot wait to see how you will go out and lead the legal profession. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much, Dean Diller. Now we are truly honored to be joined by a great leader for a great university, Fordham's president, Father Joseph McShane. Thank you very much, Nestor. Mr. Capucci, Attorney General Schneiderman, Dr. Friedman, Dean Diller, Deans Emeriti Firic and Martin, members of the faculty and administration, parents and friends of the graduates, graduates, and Gus. Before I 
Before I go into my prepared remarks, I want to offer uh, a sincere apology to all of you. Uh, as you know, this ceremony was supposed to take place outside on the grounds of Rose Hill in front of the Walsh Family Library, just uh, a little bit away from here and uh, right near where the law school began in uh, Collins Hall in 1905. And, uh, and yet, it rained. And so we're here in the oldest Division I gym in the United States. <laughs> it's historic. Um, and I apologize, you know. Why do I apologize? Because I promised the dean that I would pray for beautiful weather today. And I promised that I'd be joined in my prayer by Father McCarthy. And I'm not going to throw him under the bus. He was constant in prayer. But about 3 o'clock this morning, I fell asleep, and so we got rain instead. So I apologize. He was holding up his end of the bargain, and I was not. And Dean Diller, I, I, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. So I, I apologize. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, as we prepare to send the groundbreaking class of 2017 out into the world, I'd like to take a moment to thank the members of the faculty for all that they have done for our graduates. They have been simply extraordinary, and I'm going to ask them to stand to be acknowledged at this time. So the members of the faculty, if you would stand. Aren't you a faculty member? Thank you. I'd also like to congratulate the members of the graduating class on completing their course of study at the law school. And on behalf of the entire university community, I'd especially like to congratulate those graduates who achieved Latin honors and those who have received special awards for excellence. And on all of our behalfs, I would like to thank Attorney General Schneiderman for agreeing to serve as the keynote speaker at our ceremony this afternoon. As many of you know, the Attorney General is widely hailed as one of the hardest working and most effective attorneys general in the country. And I promise you that you will be enriched by his words when he speaks in just a few moments. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the Dodrens Bicentennial Class of 2017, we gather this afternoon to celebrate your time at the law school and all that you have accomplished in the course of that time. Of course, some of you may have picked up on the fact that I referred to you a few moments ago as the groundbreaking class of 2017. And you may have wondered what I meant when I said that. Well, I was referring to the fact that you're the first class to do all of your studies in the new, but still sadly unnamed, home of the law school. And anybody out here who has a small, a small check for 25 million, it's yours. I'll name it for you. <laughs> Therefore, you'll refer to this distinction for the rest of your lives. Trust me, you will. You will walk with swagger and you'll lord it over those poor souls who spent either part or all of their time at Fordham Law in the old building. They, of course, will tease and taunt you by saying that you attended law school in a spa like setting. Believe me, they will. My father graduated from the law school when it was located in the Woolworth Building and spent his ent entire professional life telling those who graduated from either 302 Broadway or 140 West 60th that they also studied in luxurious settings and therefore did not have the benefit of the true character-forming law school education that he did. Sigh. Such is the competitive nature of lawyers. But you already knew something about that. Now, as the faculty and administration know, around about this point, I usually launch into a bit of a pep talk that traditionally takes either one of two forms. Either I urge the law school graduates to remember how noble or even sacred the profession that, uh, that they are about to embark on or their vocation is, or I wax eloquent about the value of a Fordham Law degree. This year, <coughs> I won't be doing that as tempting as it would be to fall back into easy and familiar patterns. Rather, I'd like to reflect on something far more immediate and urgent. Now, members of the class of 2017, you began your legal studies at an uncertain and fairly dicey time, at least for lawyers in the United States. You know what I'm referring to. 
You began your studies after the Great Recession, a financial event that took an unexpectedly heavy toll on the profession to which you are about to devote your entire life. Faced with less work and a far more competitive business climate than they had ever known, large law firms cut their stamps. Jobs, therefore, became scarce practically overnight. As a result, many wondered about the future of the profession. <coughs> As a further result, law school enrollments fell sharply. And yet, in a quixotic move, and for reasons that are known only to yourselves, you steamed ahead. You decided to become a lawyer, a member of a profession that is noble and sacred. Now, I know that I promised that I would not go down that road, so sue me. It's true. Much more, I believe it. And you should hear it said often, every day if possible, noble and sacred profession. Now, I don't want to dwell on my layman's admiration for your profession. I want to go somewhere else, but not entirely. To provide you with the context for the message that I want to deliver to you this afternoon, I will just say this. FBI. To that, I will add Supreme Court. While I'm at it, let me pile on with immigration, discrimination, and anxiety. The last word in my mini litany, anxiety, should of course be seen as either the introductory word for the litany or the summative word that brings all of the others together at the end. Now, I don't really care what your party affiliation is or whom you voted for, because I suspect that party affiliation falls away when we all look at the fortunes of our beloved country at the present moment. We are all of us, Republicans and Democrats, right or left-leaning, red state or blue state, anxious. And we're anxious precisely because we are facing so many challenges, some of them homegrown, and some that have been thrust on us by foreign affairs. Our anxiety is, I believe, due to the fact there is so much uncertainty in the air. And because the roads we must travel are rough, and the signposts are either missing or obscured. We are, therefore, as a nation, disoriented, and we crave order. And so, at long last, I come to my point. We need you, desperately. Yours is not just a noble and sacred profession. I want to raise the stakes just a bit and say that yours is a necessary profession. Let that sink in. You are necessary for all of us. And I'm not talking about those frightening moments in our lives when someone says to us either, I'll see you in court, or I hope you have a good lawyer. No, no. I'm referring to something far more important than those moments. I'm referring to the present national moment, a moment that urgently needs wise guides, honest brokers, and discerning scholars who can bring civility and balance back to discussions of important topics, important matters, important issues. Balance, civility, discerning wisdom. And just where can we find people with those virtues? those habits of heart and mind. Well, for well or ill, and I think it is for well, we turn to lawyers. We turn to you. We always have. We always do. We always will. And why? Because your predecessors in the profession have taught us to. And with very few exceptions, they have never let us down. They have served us, however, not only with the qualities of mind and heart that I just mentioned, but with their devotion to justice and to the rule of law. Their mastery of the mysteries of the law, through this they have helped us to push back chaos in all its forms. They have re-erected the signposts that we need to live our lives with in order to have a sense of security. And this, my friends, is not only the legacy of your profession, it is your duty to perform these necessary and saving tasks in our uncertain age. Now, I may be prejudiced in this regard, but I think that Fordham lawyers, and that now includes you, 
are just the ones to bring balance, civility, and discerning wisdom back to the public square. I really do. I believe that with all my heart. After all, you have received a legal education that has been marked by the characteristics that have always distinguished Fordham Law and Fordham lawyers. Rigorous classroom instruction, a bracing emphasis on ethical education, and the challenge to live professional lives marked by the service of others. Intellectual rigor, integrity, service. My friends, these are the character characteristics of mind and heart that will enable you to change the world in the noble, sacred, and necessary profession that you embrace this day. You are necessary, not just for yourselves and your families. You and your profession are necessary for us all. Embrace that. See it as sacred, as noble, as saving, and as stabilizing for the nation. Because I'm telling you the truth. You are necessary. Your profession is necessary. Rejoice in it. Bear its burden. Live it every day. And may God for us all bless you and prosper the works of your hands. Thank you, Father McShane, and thank you for being so steadfast in your support of all of our students. Our next speaker is a phenomenal student who embodies the greatest strengths of student leadership at Fordham Law and has been a wonderful partner to me. I give you our outgoing SBA president, Herbie Rosen. Good afternoon, Fordham Law, Father McShane, Dean Diller, Attorney General Schneiderman, members of the faculty, trustees, administration staff, family and friends, and of course, Fordham Law's class of 2017. I'm sure by, all, uh, by now you all must know how amazing these graduates are, how challenging their journeys have been, and how fruitful their careers will be. For the family and friends here, and the staff and faculty, many of you were there for my fellow graduates, supporting them, nurturing them, inspiring them, loving them. And I want you to know that your investment has paid off. Your time, your energy, your support has paid off because the graduates here today are awe-inspiring. They are forces to be reckoned with. They are going to be impactful. Their contributions to the legal landscape and the world will be remembered. And they have already made an impact today. So let me tell you a little bit more about the impact and contributions of my friends, the class of 2017. Apart from learning the law, studying for countless hours, and somehow fitting into the elevators in the law school, more than 300 students in this room were accepted onto one of our six law journals. This year alone, our journals published more than 25 issues, totaling more than 12,000 pages. They held symposiums, colloquiums, events on thought-provoking legal issues, including the first ever Second Circuit Judges in Residence Day, where we had nine circuit judges here teaching 10 classes and over 700 students, and participating in a student town hall. Further, more than 100 students in this room competed and contributed to arbitration, mediation, trial advocacy, and appellate advocacy competitions, both nationally and internationally. Members of the class of 2017 contributed to at least 12 national or international championships, receiving more than 30 oralist, speaker, or writing awards. The class of 2017 has also logged in over 120,000 hours of public service work many students doing that through our public interest groups. Many of our students participated in our clinics, becoming advocates for their clients, fighting for causes, researching complex areas of law, and demonstrating what an effective and passionate lawyer looks like. And don't forget that many of my classmates here, while doing all of that, 
raised families, and worked full-time, and they still flourished here at Fordham Law. My friends, class of 2017, JDs, LLMs, SJDs, MSLs, thank you for your contributions. If this is what you do in one, two, three, or four years, who can imagine the contributions over 20, 30, 40 years and more? And on top of that, many members of our class donated to the 2017 class gift. At this point, I'd like to invite Dean Diller, Dean Furick, as well as our fantastic SBA class gift senators, Claire Wynn and Jeffrey Williams, and our tremendous SBA vice president, Susan Moskowitz, to present the class gift. I'm not entirely sure where the check is. We may have Venmoed it. Uh, oh, crap. You'll see over there the check. On behalf, Dean Diller and Dean Furick, on behalf of Fordham Law Class of 2017, we would like to donate $5,231 to the Furick Center for Social Justice. Thank you, members of Class of 2017. Thank you. Thank you, Herbie. Incredibly generous, every member of the class. Thank you so much. And now, please welcome our very own, our very wonderful, Professor Paul Redvani. It's my honor to present the Eugene Keefe Award, which is award to the person or persons who have made the most important contribution to the Fordham community. This year, we had two nominations who were clearly deserving of the award. The first is Nitsa Milagro Scalera, our wonderful Assistant Dean of Student Affairs and Diversity Initiatives. She's a graduate of Columbia Law School and received a Master's of Education from Teachers College at Columbia University. And of course, not only has she contributed to the Fordham community, but also the community beyond. And this year, she received the Giving Back Award from Insight into Diversity Magazine. For many years, Dean Escalera has worked tirelessly and often behind the scenes to help countless students. As Herbie Rosen has said, she is the guiding force behind the students' culture and life here on campus. She works closely with students, faculty, administrators to foster a sense of community at Fordham, and has also helped promote participation of students who are underrepresented in the legal profession. Now, it was a true testament to Dean Scalera's character and commitment to students when she found out that she and Herbie had both been nominated for this award. She immediately sought to withdraw her nomination as she had worked closely with Herbie and um, thought so highly of him that she just thought she deserved the award. But given her tremendous work on behalf of students and the Fordham community over the years, the committee refused to accept her withdrawal Unfortunately, we're able to give both of them an award, so please help me to congratulate Dean Scalera. Thank you so very much. I'm truly honored to receive this award and especially to be receiving it with Herbie. I've worked with Herbie since he was a first year rep when he was treasurer, and as, uh, there you go, <laughs> and uh, as SBA president. So Herbie, I look forward to continuing to work with you um, as an alum. Um, I accept this award in recognition of the service that my colleagues and I in the Office of Student Affairs have been able to contribute to your success as attorneys in training. So let me just give a shout out to some people. Jane, B, Rachel, Max, Sabina, Rebecca, Cynthia, Carmen, and Abel. Your commitment to being the utmost professionals, 
your sense of humor, your spirit of collaboration, and your commitment to the law school's motto of being in service of others is why I stand here today. I also want to give a shout out to the immense temps that have worked with us this week and to my law school colleagues who have volunteered at today's event. They all rock. Thank you. Thank you. So our second recipient of the Keefe Award is Herbie Rosen. And a moment ago, you just heard him talk about all the amazing activities our wonderful graduates have done while they've been at Fordham. And he knows them so well because it seems like he actually has participated in almost all of those activities. Herbie is a Stein Scholar, a Brendan Moore trial advocate, a member of the Moot Court Board, an editor on the Urban Law Journal, clinical student, a member of the Strategic Planning Committee, and in his free time, as you know, president of the Student Bar Association. But Herbie did not win this award solely because of the activities. Rather, he's deserved of the award because of his tremendous devotion and contribution to the Fordham community and his fellow students. Moreover, anyone who's worked with him know that he is the consummate team player. Please help me congratulate Herbie for this award. Thank you. Uh, I am concerned that I did something wrong. Uh, many people told me that law school was going to be the worst three years of my life, and I couldn't wait for it to uh, go by. But while these three years have indeed been stressful at times and difficult, uh, I found myself enjoying it. This was in part because I was beneficiary of the countless contributions given to me by the faculty, the staff, uh, there's something up here, that's, uh, that's why. Uh, all right, I'm back. Uh, the students, my friends. In fact, I feel that I've been taking far more than anything I may have contributed, not just in free pizza and the free food at many of your events, but in lifelong friendships and countless life-changing lessons learned. To my friends in the class of 2017, I'm in awe of you, of Kosas, of Talia, of Noah, of Max, of Chris, of countless more, of Susan, the best SBA vice president ever seen, <laughs> of countless more too numerous to mention. You all made me realize what kind of person I want to become. And you're all going to do so much, so much with your lives. I just desperately hope that I get to remain a part of it. To my professors, the staff, the administration, you made me realize what, realize what kind of lawyer I wanted to become. You demonstrated what it was to be an effective legal advocate, and I'll do my best to utilize your lessons in my own practice. And to my family, my loved ones both here and not here, my parents who worked so hard, my brothers who are rolling their eyes. <laughs> I owe you everything, and there are no words for how grateful I am. I'm not just a contributor, but I'm a beneficiary because I know all of you. But uh, if I may just contribute one thing. So, as some of you may know, I have a little bit of school spirit. And uh, we are, after all, the Rams. And uh, I think the law school needs a cheer. I've been trying to make this a thing <laughs> to varying success. So uh, Dean Diller, Father McShane, uh, maybe this could carry on. Um, I, uh, you might see some schools have cheers, Florida the Gators, Texas Hook'em Horns. Well, we are, we are the Rams. So uh, class of 2017, if you would please just humor me for a second. You, you make a fist. All right, good, everybody's good. Now, with the pointer finger, you can put it up, point it up, and then the pinky, that's the last finger there, you're gonna point that up as well. All right, but the problem is that's Texas. No, no, we're Rams, you curve it. You curve those fingers a little bit. All right, and then uh, it's pretty simple, it's just go Rams. So I think on three, 
It would just mean a lot if uh, we could, you know, make this a thing. Go Rams. So uh, here we go. One, two, three, go Rams. That's all I got. Thanks, everyone. I am so honored to be presenting the Student Choice Awards of today's ceremony. The Adjunct Faculty of the Year Award goes to Professor Michael J. Lane. A graduate of the Fordham Law Class of 1985, Professor Lane, known affectionately by his students as Mike, is an experienced civil litigator and partner at Cullen and Dykeman LLP. Mike has taught legal writing at Fordham Law for 24 years, since 1993. His dedication to teaching and to his students is profound, and he is known to make time outside the classroom to hold marathon office hours, help with internship searches, and host lunches and dinners. Notably, in 2011, the Dave Need Foundation awarded Mike the, Mike the David S. Stoner Uncommon Counselor Award for his commitment to the betterment of the legal profession and his compassion and concern for his fellow attorneys and for law students. Today, I'm very honored to present him with the Adjunct Faculty of the Year Award and thank him on behalf of the student body for his commitment to us and to Fordham Law. Thank you, Susan and Herbie. And uh, I did start teaching at the age of 12, so <laughs> that's why I look so young. Thank you, Student Bar Association, for this really wonderful award. Teaching legal writing these past 24 years has been sheer joy. Fordham is fortunate to have an excellent program run by Professors Rachel Vorspan and Ted Neustadt. I want to thank Rachel and Ted for their expertise and guidance over the years. Professor Jim Yellen and I have taught two halves of the same section for many years. I've learned a great deal from Jim, and he has been my brother, and we've had an awful lot of fun teaching. My teaching assistants have been brilliant. They have understood the importance of this class and have worked diligently addressing both the academic and personal issues that often arise in first year of law school. But the core of my teaching, as it is for any teacher, is my students. I have been fortunate to teach nearly 400 students since 1993. All of my students have challenged me, educated me, and made me a better lawyer and professor. I know it's a privilege to teach, and I'm very grateful for that honor. To all graduates and your families and loved ones here today, and I want to give a special shout out to both sections 6A and 6B. I thought I'd get more on that. <laughs> I did in rehearsal. Enjoy the happiness and celebrate the great achievement today represents. And to our graduates, you are entering, as Father McShane said, Smith McShane said, a truly sacred profession. Each of you has the ability to make people's lives better to seek to right wrongs and reverse injustices, and to make this country, indeed the world, a better place. We need your passion. We need your creativity. We need your honesty. And we need your advocacy. Thank you, and congratulations, graduates.
The second Student Choice Award for Full-Time Faculty of the Year goes to Professor Carl Minzner. <laughs> Professor Minzner is an expert in Chinese law and governance and has written extensively on these topics. Prior to joining Fordham, Professor Minzner worked in international affairs, including as senior counsel for the Congressional Executive Commission on China, as an associate at the law firm McCutcheon & Doyle at, in Palo Alto, California, and as a law clerk for Honorable Raymond Clevenger of the U.S. Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit. At Fordham, Professor Minzner is beloved by his students for the passion he brings to the classroom. He is known both by the 1Ls in his property course and the international LLM students in his Chinese law class to be the kind of professor who teaches his students how to speak, think, and argue like a lawyer. We're all very thankful to Professor Minzner for his dedication to us, and I'm honored to present him with the Faculty of the Year Award. Thank you very much. It's an honor to receive this award. Um, teaching you all makes myself and my colleagues up here um, excited to get up in the morning uh, and go to work and to be with you. Um, for the families, um, I teach, as was mentioned, a class first year property law. So there are roughly 80 to 100 students in the audience who I taught about three years ago. And I'll tell you the same thing that I tell them the first day of class. My goals are not only for them to have a solid grounding in the fundamentals of law, but also to be able to use the cases and materials that they study to clearly, effectively, and respectfully argue both for themselves and for their clients. Uh, and I'm convinced that my students can do that. And in fact, they can do it better than many of our elected officials. Um, even if I do worry that I may have introduced some sort of lasting split between section five and section eight uh, with that exercise that you guys did when I pit pitted you against each other in that fall of your 1L year. Do you guys still remember that? Section five? Yeah. And section eight? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, it's, it's been a uh, privilege to uh, watch all of you grow and develop as you've gone through law school. Uh, in some cases, this has involved seeing the unexpected sides of you develop. Uh, for example, as when, I can't see because of the lights, but I'm sure she's here. Elaine Wongsawad Jaja. I know you're around there somewhere. Yeah, there you are, yeah. I remember sort of specifically in that aforementioned exercise when you emerged as kind of the, uh, the surprise shark uh, in, that, in that exercise, taking on uh, the other side. Um, or, for example, Daisy Sexton. I know you're there, yeah. Uh, I still have a crystal clear recollection of seeing sort of how your own family influence, uh, the, you know, the family influences that had uh, helped you uh, and form who you are, particularly when you were standing up, taking on the entire class on the merits of homeowners associations, and then a week later when I was teaching these mock class to the parents' day, your mother came in and did exactly the same thing to all the other parents. That really stuck with me. Um, uh, in other cases, for other students, it's involved watching you guys set out on your own uh, processes of discovery for your own careers as you carve out your own paths. Uh, so for example, Carrie Kotcher, I know you're here, I can't see where you are, uh, but you know, welcome back from France, and I know next time it's, uh, it's Brazil for you. Um, and to all the rest of you, I would just like to say, uh, you know, congratulations on your graduation and just wish you all the best as you set out uh, on your professional career. And please come back and see us. I mean, really, after we've had this experience teaching you, we just love keeping in touch. So please come back and visit. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let me add my own congratulations to Professors Lane and Minzner. The highest honor that the law school dean confers is the Dean's Medal of Recognition, and I am pleased to present the medal this year to two extraordinary members of the Fordham Law community, Professors Nestor Davidson and Gail Hollister. Nestor Davidson joined the Fordham Law community just six years ago, and already in that short amount of time he has made a remarkable impact on the life of the school. He has brought to Fordham all the talents and insights 
gained from his distinguished career in teaching, private practice, and government service, including a Supreme Court clerkship with Associate Justice David Souter. When Nestor arrived at Fordham Law in 2011, he made a profound mark almost immediately by founding the school's Urban Law Center. The center is at the forefront of studying our global society's increasing urbanization, and Nestor leads the center with incredible vision. His scholarship is expansive. He closely studies the issues that cities across the world face and identifies patterns and proposes ways that cities can learn from one another and inform each other. Nestor's intellect alone makes him an invaluable asset to the school, but he has something more that inspires even greater things in his colleagues, including me. I'm referring to Nestor's enduring optimism. For the past three years, Nestor has served as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, and he has brought to the senior leadership team a refreshing sense that everything is possible. With patience, strategic thinking, enthusiasm, and energy, we can achieve anything. This positive thinking affirms our day-to-day -day work, and Nestor knows that all of our work is in the service of our students. Nestor is seriously committed to the school's academic mission, and he feels passionately that each and every Fordham Law student, each and every one of you, should go out into the world with a full range of legal skills. And for Nestor, legal skills are not limited to the intricacies and nuances of the law itself, although, of course, that's fundamental. But Nestor also focuses on helping you make the transition from smart student to capable professional so that you can learn to lead teams, to communicate with your peers, to exhibit good judgment, and to serve your clients well. These are the necessary people skills that it takes to be a great lawyer, and Nestor has spent his administrative leadership ensuring that you have what it takes not simply to succeed, but to excel. He's been boundlessly creative in finding innovative ways for the school to serve you better. And he has been tremendously open to the creativity and ideas of others. This generosity of spirit allows him not just to stay on top of an astonishing array of projects, but to guide them with a mastery and clarity that's difficult to achieve in higher education. Fordham Law is very fortunate to have Nestor Davidson helping lead it, and I have been very lucky to have him as a colleague and friend. He's been a great support and advisor to me as I came on board as dean, and I'm so grateful for his service as a member of the deaconal team. While he's stepping down as associate dean this year, he will remain a stalwart member of the Fordham Law faculty, and he will continue to inspire all of us at the school to do right by you, our graduates, and our students. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to present Nestor Davidson with the, Dean, with the Dean's Medal of Recognition. Thank you so much, Dean Diller. You have been an inspiration to me and I'm grateful to have had the chance to serve as your Associate Dean for Academic Affairs as your deanship has flourished so wonderfully right out of the gate. And another inspiration is Professor Hollister. I'm so glad to be able to share this award with you. And let me thank again Father McShane and our Provost Stephen Friedman and all of my colleagues in the administration, on the staff and on the faculty at the law school. So, like you, I feel like I'm graduating. It has been three years for me, as it has been for many of you. Uh, and I'm getting promoted back to the regular faculty, uh, where I'll start teaching again next fall. When I became associate dean three years ago, I spent some time trying to figure out exactly what it was that an associate dean does. A question I still get to this day. Is it being an air traffic controller, making sure the planes land? Is it to make sure the trains run on time? basically a chief compliance officer paired with a taskmaster. Well, I, I'm sure there's a little bit of each of that, but really not so much. The planes land, the trains run, whether or not you lose sleep over it or not. As I've thought about this, time, this job over the time I've been associate dean, I've come to realize that the heart of the position is something else entirely. It is chiefly about helping everyone 
involved in our core academic mission, do what it is that they do best. We have a remarkable faculty and a phenomenal team dedicated to making a Fordham Law School education truly world class, and I've been proud to work hard every day as Associate Dean to support that work. And as many people have said today, that work is more vital than ever. Our law school is perfectly poised for the moment we face. We critically need lawyers dedicated to the rule of law, steeped in the craft of problem solving with an ethos of service. That is the precious gift that Fordham Law has to offer. And each and every one of you graduating today carries that gift into the world. It has been an honor to help along the way. Thank you. Um, you left something up here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nestor. When Gail Hollister joined the Fordham Law faculty in 1977, she was one of only a few women on the full-time faculty. And the full-time faculty itself was not very large. There were fewer than 25 professors. The law school's administrative staff numbered a paltry three, the dean, assistant dean, and the registrar. Gail quickly became an instrumental member, not only of the faculty, but of the administration. She served at the school, as the school's first assistant dean of student affairs, inaugurating a role that has come to be one of the most critical in shaping student experiences. Decades later, she would also serve as the first associate dean for administration. By the time I started at Fordham Law as a professor in 1993, Gail was already something of a legend in the classroom. She earned major plaudits from her students for her brilliance, for knowing tort law inside and out, and for her matchless ability to answer students' questions carefully and thoroughly by providing crystal clear examples. The very foundation of Gail's superb teaching style is her desire to instill in her students a deep knowledge and full appreciation of the law and the precision of its language and logic. She is not, however, dogmatic and unyielding. She understands the adaptability of the law and teaches her students how thorny legal questions lead the law to flex and accommodate new ideas and perspectives. How did Gail come to understand the law so deeply and to teach it so well? She must have gone to a great law school, and indeed she did. She graduated from Fordham Law School in 1970. Gail Clark for Judge Inzer Wyatt of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York and then practiced as an attorney at Webster and Sheffield and then later at Merrill Lynch. Thankfully for all of us, she returned to her law school to teach torts, legal process, and legal writing, among other subjects. As the longtime Archibald Murray Professor of Law, she also dedicated a significant amount of time to helping people in the community. Gail has said that her greatest joy as a professor came from helping students develop their legal skills. And I can say that over the decades, Gail has been one of the law school's great joys. Gail announced her retirement earlier this academic year. And while we are very sad to see her step outside the classroom, she is fortunately not straying too far from Fordham Law. Gail has promised me that she will continue to be actively involved with the school and with our community. And of course, she will continue all of her outside engagements, including her service as a hearing officer for the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. For almost 40 years, Gail has been a consummate teacher of the law and a wonderful colleague and friend to so many of us at the Fordham Law School. It's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to present Gail Hollister with the Dean's Medal of Recognition. Thank you, Dean Diller, for these very kind words and for bestowing such an honor on me. To receive this medal on the same day it was awarded to Dean Davidson is especially humbling. Um, I give thanks to many, my family, my colleagues, and our wonderful students. 
but I thought today I should try a few words about the institution itself. I came to Fordham, as we just heard, as a 1L student almost 50 years ago. When I arrived, I had no idea how fortunate I was to have chosen Fordham over Columbia and NYU, but I would soon learn. Uh, the law school was then, as it is now, a community, a community that welcomed me, taught me how to read a case, how to analyze problems, and how to construct an argument that, at least some of the time, uh, convinced others that my client should prevail. The law school also proved to be the source of a lifelong friendships, and it provided a multitude of mentors, people ready and able to throw light on questions, to encourage each one of us, and to open doors. When I returned as a faculty member, I relearned the joy of being a part of this community, the fun it was to continue to learn from Dean McLaughlin, Dean Farrick, and so many others. I also discovered the pleasure of working with Fordham's remarkable students like you, students from many different backgrounds who bring new ideas and interesting slants on legal issues. Finally, to come to work every day in a school whose motto is in the service of others has greatly enriched my life. As you can see, uh, Fordham has been a place where I have learned much about the law and about a, a lot of much more important things. It is important, uh, and my hope and belief, that each of you has been similarly nourished by the Fordham community and that you will continue as part of that community as you go forth. I'm incredibly grateful to Dean Diller for giving me this medal, yet another gift from Fordham. Thank you. It is my distinct pleasure to invite New York State Attorney General Eric Schneiderman to come forward uh, with his faculty sponsor, Professor, Professor Andrew Kent. I also invite Mr. Vincent Capucci, trustee of Fordham University and a member of the Board of Trustees, Father Joseph McShane, president of Fordham University, and Dr. Stephen Friedman, provost to Fordham University for the conferral of the honorary degree. Throughout his career, Eric Schneiderman, the Attorney General of New York, has been driven by the conviction that no one, no matter how powerful, is above the law. He has stood up for the people he serves, advocating reforms to the criminal justice system, strengthening environmental and consumer protections, and safeguarding immigration rights. As a state senator, Mr. Schneiderman led the reform of New York's Rockefeller drug laws and helped enact new anti-fraud measures protecting taxpayers. As Attorney General, he resisted pressure from the Obama administration to settle a lawsuit against big banks over alleged dubious mortgage practices, eventually helping to win settlements that were much larger. And in 2017, he joined a lawsuit that successfully opposed the Trump administration's executive order on immigration. He has been at the forefront of state attorneys generally seeking to act as a check on Washington and has pledged to keep challenging the federal government to ensure that laws protecting New Yorkers are enforced. For his leadership in the service of others and his unflagging commitment to the rule of law, we, the President and Trustees of Fordham University, in solemn convocation assembled 
and in accord with the chartered authority bestowed upon us by the Regents of the University of the State of New York, declare Eric T. Schneiderman Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa, and that he may enjoy all the rights and privileges of this, our highest honor. We have issued these letters patent under our hand and under the corporate seal of the university on this, the 20th day of May in the year of our Lord, 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our honorary degree recipient and today's speaker, Attorney General Eric Schneiderman. Thank you, and uh, to my classmates, got mine first. Um, thank you, and, and thank you for allowing me to share this uh, happy occasion uh, with you and, and really very moving occasion. It's, it's quite a community you have here. Father McShane, Professor Kent, Associate Dean Davidson, Provost Friedman, um, Trustee Capucci, thank you all for this honor. And to all of you who are, uh, are here today, I, I want to especially call out your Dean, Matthew Diller. Uh, I thank you for your great words, your kind introduction, and for your leadership of this vital institution. The dean and I have worked together uh, and known each other for some time. And uh, it's not a surprise to me that Fordham Law School is, is taking the uh, aggressive direction of leadership that it is uh, right now and that it is under his leadership. I'm excited to be here today with you. Uh, you are now my colleagues in the law, and it's great to welcome so many new colleagues. So congratulations, class of 2017. Give yourselves a round of applause. <clears throat> and savor that magical window that non-lawyers will never understand between the end of your academic travails and the bar exam. It's a special, it's a special moment and, and to be savored. Um, and you, you really should be proud of your achievements today, not your academic achievements or, or intellectual achievements or Red Bull consumption achievements uh, or whatever else uh, stays with you from these years. But as been said several times today, and Father McShane emphasized this, you know, this is an honorific occasion. We don these robes. But um, in recent months, I have been reminded more so really than at almost any time in my career of th really the greatness of this tradition and what a true honor it is to be an American lawyer. You are now joining the ranks of the guardians of the rule of law and of the fundamental American promise of equal justice under law. That is what we do as American lawyers. So uh, welcome. And I know, I know the dean had you do this before, but, but really, please, do take another moment to think about all of those who helped to support you, those who are here, those who are not here. Uh, none of us achieves anything in life alone. There's a phenomenon my rabbi speaks about that is a troublesome, extremely vexing phenomenon in our contemporary society, which he calls the self-made man who worships his creator. <laughs> Not God, but he worships his creator. And nobody achieves anything alone. So please share this moment to all the families, the parents, the friends, the spouses, the mentors, children in some cases, everyone who helped this class get there. Thank you for having us all here today and making this possible. Um, now, I am, uh, I have not actually received that many honorary degrees. I'm particularly honored to be here today at Fordham, there are very deep connections between my office, the Office of the New York State Attorney General, and Fordham Law School. My longest serving 
predecessor, Louis Lefkowitz, was a Fordham graduate, class of 1925. And Attorney General Lefkowitz uh, really transformed the Office of Attorney General. And I want to speak to you today about the law as a transformational vehicle and your work as transformational uh, attorneys and transformational uh, workers in our in, in the mechanisms of our society. But Louis Lefkowitz changed the role of the Attorney General of New York State, eventually influencing the roles of Attorneys General all across America. Traditionally, uh, State Attorneys General represented the state, and, and it was really A.G. Lefkowitz who took on the role of affirmatively representing the people of the state in uh, affirmative cases for consumer protection, the environment, civil rights, and to this day, our awards for outstanding achievement by assistant attorneys general are called the Lefkowitz Awards. So there are two institutions that give out Lefkowitz Awards, Fordham Law School and the Office of the New York State Attorney General, and I am very proud to be here in that tradition. But uh, in addition to that and the fact that there are Fordham graduates throughout my bureaus all across our office, uh, there is really no connection more important today between Fordham Law School and my office than our shared commitment to equal justice for all. And really under Dean Diller's leadership and with the support of your extraordinary faculty, uh, Fordham Law School has become a national leader in the movement for access to justice. Uh, among his other endeavors, Dean Diller serves on the permanent committee on access to justice. And since the commission's inception, there has been an increase in the percentage of low income New Yorkers who enter the courthouse with a lawyer. But the dean and his allies in this effort, including my good friend, uh, former Chief Judge Jonathan Lippman, were not satisfied with incremental progress. So they established the National Center for Access to Justice here and launched a school-wide Access to Justice initiative. And you are really in the process now of setting a national standard for transforming the debate over the justice gap, which is the disparity between the need for and the access to legal services. So I hope, as I hope many of you know, this, this center conducts groundbreaking research, created this justice index that ranks states on their adoption of best practices for providing access to justice. And it's all part of a broader effort to redefine how we think about uh, the right to counsel in America, how we think about uh, the reforms that are necessary to truly make equal justice under law a reality. And this is a great example of, of, of what I want to talk to you about today and, and what I want to challenge you to do in your careers. There, in my view, uh, I've written about two different kinds of work that we can have the opportunity to do that can make a big difference in people's lives. And I, I think of them as transactional legal and political work and transformational legal and political work. You could also think of them as incremental rather than systemic reforms, but both are very important. And I, I've written about this some time, for some time. When I'm representing a client in court, transactional work, legal work is pretty straightforward. I need to get the best result I can get today, given the current state of the law, the facts of the case. I am see in seeking to enact legislation. For those of you who may have an opportunity to work on that aspect of, of the law, which I hope some of you will. The question in transactional work is, what's the best deal I can get today on a health care bill or an immigration reform bill or a gun control bill during this year's legislative session? What's the best I can do given the state of public opinion and the state of the power structure? Transactional legal and political work requires us to be pra pragmatic about current realities and precedents and opinions. It's all about getting the best possible result given the circumstances here and now. Transformational work, on the other hand, is the work we're doing today to bring about systemic reforms that may not take place for some time. What I'm doing now so that a future client has better options when they end up in court. What am I doing to, do, to change the course of public debate so the deal I can get on a health care bill or an immigration bill or a gun control bill in a year or five years or 20 years will be better than the deal I can get Today, transformational work involves changing consciousness, changing the language of debate, challenging people to think about issues differently and open themselves to new possibilities. So when Fordham provides a pro bono counsel to an individual immigrant, uh, 
through the award-winning Immigration Advocacy Project, that's important work. That's good, that's good transactional work. You get the best result for your client, given the state of the law today. But when you undertake an access to justice initiative to change public awareness about the importance of the right to counsel and bring systemic reforms to our laws and policies, that is transformational work. And as American lawyers, I would argue that you really have to make an effort to weave both of them into your career to experience the full richness of life in the law. Now, the genius of our system is that it is designed to change and evolve. And American lawyers have always been the leaders in transformational as well as transactional legal and political work. Uh, I would urge you to consider uh, then back when our counterparts in the medical profession were still using leeches, a group of lawyers got together to write the Constitution in the Federalist Papers. And I do believe that it is a central calling of all American lawyers, not just to represent clients or draft legislation to get the best results today, but also to try to bring about long-term systemic changes to transform our society and to make it more equal. I personally believe that every generation of American lawyers is called to participate in the great project of making the Founders' historic commitment to equal justice under law ever more true. And today, as you join our ranks, you are called. Uh, I would urge all of you to master the transactional skills of lawyering. It's very satisfying, but also look for the opportunities in your career to do transformational work. Let me give you one of my favorite examples and talk about a personal hero of mine who epitomizes my vision of transformational lawyering, uh, a, a, an attorney named Charles Hamilton Houston, who is a very successful lawyer, African-American attorney in Washington, D.C., in the 1920s and 30s. And back then, under the Supreme Court's ruling in Plessy v. Ferguson, segregation was legal. Uh, Jim Crow laws, separate railroad cars, separate restaurants, separate bathrooms, were considered to be constitutionally permissible. And of course, lynching and other forms of racial terrorism were rampant through much of the country. Now, at that time, the NAACP was in existence, but it represented individuals, victims of discrimination, and the families of people uh, who were facing lynching and other violence. These cases were profoundly important for the individual clients, but they didn't bring about any real change to the overarching system of Jim Crow laws. So Charles Hamilton Houston came on the scene, tough lawyer, but was determined to make systemic change. And in 1934, he sat down and wrote a memo to the NAACP setting forth a legal and communications and political strategy to end legal segregation in America, to bring cases to advance legislation, to raise awareness, all with the single-minded objective of overturning Plessy and his plan was adopted. They gave him the staggering budget of $10,000 to carry out his plan to end segregation in America. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was how a group of lawyers really began what became the American Civil Rights Movement. And at the outset, of course, it was, it was a very small group. Houston gathered together a small group of lawyers, writers, and activists, but the strategy was brilliant. Um, Houston knew that if he started trying to integrate elementary schools, there would be uh, riots and even more lynchings. So he started with challenges uh, that focused uh, on th struggles he thought he could win. Fo he first focused on segregated graduate schools in border states. And in the case of Murray v. Maryland, which forced the University of Maryland to integrate its law school, uh, the strategy began to bear fruit. But the Houston and his team understood that transformational work is about more than just what happens in one case. So it's about changing hearts and minds and the way people think about an issue. So they embarked on a relentless campaign of public education. They actually made films. Uh, they wrote. Uh, they set about to travel around the country doing advocacy, changing the way Americans understood race. And the movement grew and grew. But to me, the most remarkable thing about this this great lawyer and his story is that he spent his life knowing he probably would never end to live to see the end of his struggle and his campaign to end segregation. 
he did in fact not live to see the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He did not live to see his law student and protege, a lawyer named Thurgood Marshall, who he trained, overturn Plessy when Marshall argued Brown v. Board of Education. But Houston had the vision and the confidence in our system of laws and government that our system is designed to evolve and change towards greater justice and greater equality to devote his life to that cause. He believed that each of us can bend the arc of history towards justice, and in this he succeeded. And this is the heart of my message for you today, class of 2017. You are joining a tradition of American lawyers in which you will seek justice for your clients every day, but as lawyers you can also seek to transform society if you seek out opportunities to work towards systemic reform over the long term as Houston did. Now, you are entering at a particular moment where this work is needed more than ever. And I'm proud of the transactional work that I've done in my career. I was in private practice representing clients for uh, many years as a state senator. I looked to pass legislation and make the best deals I could given the current realities I faced when I was looking at a bill. But some, the most gratifying moments in my career in many ways have been when I've been able to participate in truly transformational work. And those, one of those opportunities came, and it was mentioned earlier, I was the lead sponsor of the legislation to repeal the Rockefeller drug laws. And it's, it's hard to keep in perspective because it's a few years have gone by, but New York had the most destructive and racially discriminatory sentencing laws for drug crimes in the entire country, passed in 1973. And, and I had seen early in my career the failings of our criminal justice system in dealing with people with substance abuse problems. And I actually took two years between college and law school uh, and worked as a deputy sheriff in a county jail. And I watched uh, over a period of decades as state after state, following New York's lead, I'm ashamed to say, passed laws requiring long mandatory minimum sentences or three strikes in your outlaws. By the time I got to the state senate in 1999, we were a country with 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. Mass incarceration had come on us, and between 1970 and 2005, there was a 500% increase with our prison population, which brought about no reduction in crime. Now, as a lawyer, um, sometimes I would represent individual clients to try and cut better deals or petition to get their sentences reduced, and when I succeeded, it would be life-changing for that individual client, but I really wanted to bring about broader reform, so I joined an emerging movement to change public consciousness and bring about total repeal of the Rockefeller drug laws. And it was, uh, the campaign became known as the Drop the Rock campaign, and it was an extraordinary experience of mobilizing lawyers, many judges and retired judges who opposed these laws, academics, journalists, community activists, to, dis to challenge not just the specifics of a case, but the destructive logic of mass incarceration, to humanize its victims and shift the public's conception of nonviolent drug offenses from criminal justice to a public health issue. And by the time we finished, the debate had changed so that the word draconian was appended to the front of Rockefeller drug laws. You could not read an article in any newspaper that did not refer to the draconian Rockefeller drug laws. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is an aspect of how you change consciousness and how you change the language of the debate. By 2009, even those who didn't really know what they were seemed to think there was something wrong with the Rockefeller drug laws. And that was the year I was able to sponsor the bill that by one vote, one repeal in the New York State Senate. And in the years since we accomplished that and dropped the rock as our campaign became to be called, crime has gone down while our prison population has gone down, our recidivism rate has gone down, and our reforms helped bolster a campaign all across our Amer America to change the laws and change the way we think about uh, drugs and crime and mass incarceration. It is one of the most satisfying things I've ever had a the opportunity to be a part of, and it's the kind of work I commend to you. Uh, now is the time, class of 2017, to think big, to think about transformation. We're in a moment of tremendous fluidity in terms of of, of politics and the law, there is, as uh, has been acknowledged several times, anxiety and stress 
uh, abounding in society about the state of things. And you as lawyers are the guardians of a structure to ensure that through all of the emotion and all the vicissitudes of, of current events, the law stays true and stays as a guideline for equality and justice. This is the way our system was designed, and that system was entrusted to you as lawyers. Now, in, in my office, uh, I represent the state and the people of the state in individual cases, but we're always looking for systemic challenges. And one thing, another thing that I, I want to speak about it as I close, that at the class of 2017, you are graduating in a moment that really cries out for transformational legal work in healthcare, law enforcement, education, and what I want to focus on as I close, immigration. Now, it has been acknowledged earlier that Fordham has this great award-winning immigration advocacy project, and that my office was involved in the e successful effort to strike down the travel ban that the President issued on January 27th. Let me talk to you about the transformation that that experience brought about in my office and in the offices of state attorneys general around the country. And I believe it started something that is going to present a changed role for us and for lawyers generally in the months and years ahead. Uh, on January 27th, when the President issued the, this, uh, to me, un-American anti-Muslim executive order uh, regarding immigrants, travelers, and refugees, it really did present a challenge in my mind to the rule of law. It was. Uh, in my view, uh, anti-American and discriminatory, and the courts agreed with that. It was also uh, badly drafted. It was rolled out incoherently. Uh, someone at the Brookings Institute wrote an article about it called Malevolence Tempered by Incompetence, which sort of captures the whole feeling of that extraordinary moment. But the thing that was so striking to me was the response of the legal community as a whole. Thousands of lawyers went out to airports just to see if they could provide legal services to someone. Uh, you don't usually think of New York lawyers as the sort of most compassionate group of people in the world, but people were calling my office saying, I, am, I don't care. I'm going to a clinic. I'm going to an airport. I'm going to so somewhere where I think I might be able to help somebody to support immigrants and the families caught up in the turmoil. For my part, this hit on a Friday afternoon, and I essentially was, was there on the phone and on the computer for the whole weekend, reaching out to my colleagues in other states, lawyers for public interest organizations. It was clear to us that uh, no one in the federal government, in Congress or the executive branch, was going to help. So we realized we had to mobilize at the state level in a way we never really had before. And it was an unprecedented uh, event. For the first time, it really, in American history, uh, a group of attorneys general. By Sunday, we had 17 attorneys general representing more than 130 million people issue a joint statement, uh, and this has not really ever happened before, stating that this was un-American, unconstitutional, and if the federal government wasn't going to tell you the truth, we were, and that we were going to go into court to stop it. And then we did. And we went into courts all around the United States. We figured out who got the best chance to get uh, a, a, per, a national injunction. Turned out to be in Washington State. There were AGs and, and other lawyers representing public interest groups and, and detainees who didn't, you know, didn't think they had the best position or the best facts or the best judge. Great uh, collegial experience of people who didn't have the best shot withdrawing their cases or slowing them down. We threw in with our colleagues in Washington, won a permanent injunction, got it upheld by the Ninth Circuit, and travelers whose lives have been thrown into turmoil were once again able to obtain visas, enter the United States, including, as has been acknowledged, the daughter of one of your classmates. And I'm very pleased that that worked out as it worked out for people all around the United States. They were able to come in for emergency medical care, for family reasons, for professional reasons. And now, individually, each of the lawyers that represented a detainee did great work for that individual client. But collectively, my new colleagues, the outpouring of the bar, the development, the emergence of what I consider to be really sort of the legal resistance, lawyers standing up for the rule of law, lawyers sending the message, 
that we are not going to put up with any deviation from the rule of law. We're not, if the checks and balances are not in Washington, we will provide them through the legal system and the courts. And we sent a powerful message that the community of lawyers, your community at large, will stand up for the rule of law, and no one, including the President of the United States, is above the rule of law. So, class of 2017, it's appropriate that you are Rams, because what's, I, I was afraid that Herbie, when he said, I have a cheer, was going to bang his head into the podium, but <laughs> perhaps in other occasions. Um, there will be those days, so don't, uh, don't think that any of us are above having banged our head against a wall occasionally. But as you go forward, as you go forward, what is required is that sort of perseverance, that unwillingness to wait till the door is open. Sometimes you have to push through doors. Sometimes you have to push through walls. And right now, you are entering this tradition at an extraordinary moment when the need for the affirmation of the duty of lawyers, American lawyers, to, to preserve the rule of law, to keep the promise of equal justice under law alive, to work for transformational change is more important than ever. You have to do that because our goal as lawyers is not just to take the law as it is and practice it transactionally, but to improve the law. That's part of our ethical guidelines to seek to improve the law. And to me, that means each of us should seek to leave our country a little more equal and a little more just than when we found it, as Charles Hamilton Houston did, as Louis Lefkowitz did, as those of us committed to the rule of law try to do. The years ahead will present many opportunities for all those of us committed to the rule of law and committed to transformational change. My fellow lawyers, I urge you to embrace those opportunities. Your generation will have a profound say on the future of the American enterprise of one set of rules for everyone and equal justice under law. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you so much, Attorney General Schneiderman. Talk about transformational. And now, let me welcome back Professor Paul Redvani, who, among his many contributions to the law school, uh, is, the act is the chair of our Honors Committee to present our student awards. Okay, one, the one request I have is that you hold your applause um, till the very end. Um, there's a description of the award, so I'm not going to read the description of each award. I'll read the award and its recipients in a moment, but there's one award that's left out of the program, so I'm just going to briefly read that description, and that's the Jereen Frankel Robbie Prize. Um, she was a 1979 Fordham Law School graduate, where she was editor of the Law Review, earned her MS from Columbia University Library School. She practiced law and worked as a law librarian prior to returning to Fordham. And from 90, 1988 until her retirement in 2010, Professor Ravi served as a reference librarian and adjunct professor at Fordham Law School. The award honors Professor Ravi, whose love and dedication to teaching legal research was surpassed only by her skill and expertise as a law librarian. And the award is awarded to Elena Halatian. No, 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 okay. Um, the Abraham Abramovsky Award goes to Bethany Smith, the Burton Award to Joshua Liebman, the Class of 1911 Prize to Brianna Olivia Gallo, the Joseph Crowley Award to Elizabeth Tweedy McMorris and Kathy Walter, the Mary, Mary Daly Prize in Legal Ethics to Joshua Liebman, the Dean's Special Achievement Award 
to Maria Simone Hakim and Susan Lynn Moskowitz. The Donald Farrick uh, Prize in Labor Law to Shana Wood and Jason Michael Balsamo. The Professor Fusco Memorial Award to Kelly Reddington. The Walter Kennedy Award to Max Bernstein, Joshua Cohen, Danielle Angela Rapacholi. And the Donald Magnetti Award to Sahar Moazami and Alexandra White. Okay, I said no clapping, but no cheering, too. The Lawrence McKay Prize to Gregory Paul Cronin, Meredith Crimmins Monroe, and Emily Duffel Safka. The Keith Miller Memorial Award to Greg Cronin, the Adele Monaco Memorial Award to Joshua Demopoulos, to, and Jay Kays, the Ann Moynihan Award to Christopher Nash Fennell, Joshua Lehman, and Gabriel Joseph Rialli, the Monsignor James Murray Prize for Achievement in Public Service to Lorena Michelle Heron, and the National Association of Women's Lawyers to Marjorie Dugan. We're almost done. The Perchamovsky Siegelman Student Graduation Prize to Lauren Astronardi, and last but not least, you can applaud in a second, the Robert Aram Renzulli Prize in Criminal Law to Claire Sarah Glass. Thank you, Professor Radvani. And now, for our graduates. I am delighted to be joined by Assistant Dean Jaeger Fine, Associate Dean Huntington, and Associate Dean Hill. Dean Jaeger Fine, take us away. Thank you, Dean Davidson. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of reading the names of the recipients of the SJD, LLM, and MSL degrees. Many of our graduate students hold degrees from countries outside the United States. After each graduate's name, I will indicate the country from which he or she received a primary degree. Please hold your applause until all of the graduate student names have been announced. The recipients of the Doctor of Juridical Science degree the highest degree awarded by the law school. Sung Yong Kang, Korea. Zera Gulay Kavami Eroglu, Turkey. Vera Korzen, Belarus. Recipients of the Master of Laws degree in Banking, Corporate, and Finance Law. Hussam Al Tiabi, Saudi Arabia. Gonzalo Anton, Spain. Carolina Hadassah Pinto Astuti, Brazil. Mohamed Baba, Lebanon. Sara Sokoga Bala Gabobo, Nigeria. Alan William Basil Colon, Dominican Republic. <laughs> Shane Bell, United States. Rosanna Paola Bellina, Italy. Tomasine Bolorunduro, United Kingdom. Arnaud Charpentier, France. Olga Cheklov, Latvia. Arturo Choclan Fernandez, Spain. Alfonso Coronel de Palma de la Mata, Spain. Buze Destigiolu, Turkey. Amir Fadavi Ardekani, Islamic Republic of Iran. <laughs> Hasti Fer Feriduni, Germany. <laughs> 
Cynthia Lombardi Ribeiro Flynn, Brazil. Omar Foda, Egypt. Eleftheria Giannakopoulos, Greece. Mariana Paloiello Criviente de Castro Guimaras, Brazil. Fernanda Caldas Gutel Falero, Brazil. Amit Hazan, Israel. Monique Elizabeth Holmes, United States. Tongi Hubert, France. Kunja, China. Rajani Murdihar Kamath, India. Fatma Karalioglu, Turkey. Alexandre Liturgis Koyans, France. Min Li, China. Gilad Lindenfeld, Israel. Rukang Gong Lo, China. Shao Chen Lo, China. We have Baba coming with this child, so he's just taking a photo. Okay. Mohammed Baba, Lebanon, with his beautiful daughter. Xiao Chen Lo, China. Esteban Mayra, Chile. Kushbu Nitin Hina Maskai, India. Enrique J. Matavadillo, Mexico. <laughs> Roxana Mirani, France. <laughs> Shiva Kumar Ati Nahapan, United Kingdom. Mariana Nasser Berlesi, Brazil. <laughs> Rebecca O'Brien, United Kingdom. Mia Piss, Croatia. Tio Rue, France. Ernesto Ruiz Guelbenzu, Spain. Juan Ignacio Sanguinetti Ferrero, Argentina. Stefano Secamani Mazzoli, Italy. Paloma Seta, United States. Raluca Tomnius, Romania. Mari Tomunin, Finland. Samridi Rajit Upadhyaya, India. Jiang Yi Wong, China. Elitsa Yordanova, United Kingdom. Shao <laughs> Chi Yu, China. Juan Bautista Zambon, Argentina. The recipients of the Master of Laws degree in Corporate Compliance, Harriet Laverne Clemens, United States. Pierre de Camp, France. Oded Friedman, Germany. Andrea Garcia Castellao, Spain. Kyung Suk Kim, South Korea, with his beautiful daughter. Seong <laughs> Su Kim, South Korea. Krina Modi, India.
Manuela Mutoni, Italy, with her beautiful son. Mutoni. Carolina Pineda Martinez, Colombia. Recipients of the Master of Laws degree in Fashion Law, Mary Catherine Brennan, United States. Mary's congratulatory letter will be presented by her father, Lawrence Brennan, class of 1977. <laughs> Stephanie Casimon, Belgium. Marie Funel, France. Ariel Mai, United States. Krina Merchant, United Kingdom. Patrick Anthony Real, United States. Sophie Rothstein, United States. Emma Zahara Shah, United States. Recipients of the Master of Laws degree in Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law, Meta Alganmi, Saudi Arabia. Sichuan Tsai, China. Li Wei Chen, China. Vera Colavo, Italy. Celeste de Fournier, United Kingdom. Leanne Farsi, United Kingdom. Da Ai Kwan, South Korea. Mandy Lee, China. Milagros Lopez, Dominican Republic. Ted Mulvaney, Ireland. Pieter Munich, the Netherlands. Chinwei Nwadiora, United States. Jason Okanlawan, Nigeria. Virginie Reynal, France. Devanshi Shah, India. Narmeen Sheikh, United Kingdom. Rocio Vasquez Blasquez, Spain. Josephine Weil, France. The recipients of the Master of Laws degree in International Business and Trade Law, Ramzi Abutam, Lebanon. Mohammed Rashid Azan, United Kingdom. Babia Lakshmi Basotia, India. Catalina Maria Baker Varela, Argentina. Malcolm Biga Nwanak, France. Sung Wook Cha, South Korea. Mercy Delore, Ghana. Aoud El Esawi, Saudi Arabia. Merv Ayuboglo, Turkey. Dilek Kazakh, Turkey. Hongmei Lin, United Kingdom. Shun Zhao Ma, China. Isabella Melo Ferreira Bill, Brazil. Ram Oz, Israel. Ariana Del Carmen Palacios Chavez Tafor, Peru. Isabella Pires, Brazil. Victoria Popetsko, Belarus. Elnaz Razavi, Islamic Republic of Iran. Aslihan Rutledge, Turkey.
Patricia Sanabria Gonzalez, Spain. Evgenia Sitnikova, United States. Daria Speshilova, Russian Federation. Yu Shen Sun, China. Mar Mara Rita Vento, United States. Anusiga Yogeswaran, United Kingdom. Recipients of the Master of Laws degree in International Dispute Resolution, Luis Divar Bilbao, Spain. Santiago Ernais Bravo, Mexico. Justin E. Lin, United States. Sarah Mana, France. Aurelien Martineau, France. Lucy Onyeforo, United Kingdom. Mark Howard Patterson, United States. Maria Amelia Reyes Vargas, Dominican Republic. Veronica Timofiva, United Kingdom. Gregor Weber, Germany. Recipients of the Master of Laws degree in International Law and Justice, Audrey Nana Abayena, Ghana. Esra Youssef Alamiri, Egypt. Anna Chiara Amato, Italy. Claudia Codovini, Italy. Anna Dreves, Germany. Anna Goizueta Zubimendi, Spain. Zachary Ralu, uh, sorry, sorry. Alia Hijasi, Saudi Arabia. Hyo In Kang, South Korea. Zachary Ralu. Kiriakapulu with her beautiful daughter from Greece. <laughs> Ming Shan John Bosco Leung from Hong Kong. <laughs> Xiao Wenliang, China. Wei Li, China. Fabien Laurier, France. Anna Teresa Meyer, United Kingdom. Fahima Mohammadi Kashkuli, Islamic Republic of Iran. Sofia Murashovsky, Russian Federation. Yelena Petrovich, Serbia. Miriam Corticelli, Italy. Yue Tan, China. Dila Torlak, Turkey. Avima Upetri, Nepal. Cynthia Wiredu, Ghana. Recipients of the Master of Laws degree in United States Law, Enrico Bevenuto, Italy. Enrico's congratulatory letter will be presented by his brother, Eugenio Bevenuto, class of 2015. Adela Borta, Romania. Mathilde Bossi, France. Carl Buhler, France. Amadeo Carvalhas Rivero, Brazil. Mia Chaber, Lebanon. Thais Elena de Caroz Garcia, Brazil. Andrea Diaz Varela Vargas, Spain. 
Jingzhe Huang, China. Hyung Ju Jung, South Korea. Byung Sam Kang, South Korea. Yasko Kitamura, Japan. Felipe de Oliveira Kraus, Brazil. George H. Lino, Brazil. Milena Maneval, France. Timo Putio, Finland. Kristina Razumova, Russian Federation. Ana Maria Sanchez Roa, France. Alexandra Tavered, Russian Federation. Yixing Wang, China. Kotaro Yoshimura, Japan. Chi Tsung, China. Chen Chi Chao, China. Recipients of the Master of Studies in Law in Corporate Compliance. Eugene Chen, United States. Joanna Lopez Paraiso, United States. Davide Zepp, Italy. Recipients of the Master of Studies in Law in Fashion, Jenna Ashley Agatep, United States. Giovanna Bernice Johnson, United States. Alexis Lostrito Udell, United States. Mustafa Musa, Egypt. Monique De Angeli Batarina Padrid, United States. Mary Stephanie Pasqualetto, United States. Kanako Suzuki, United States. Ahimwen Ma Vosper Vokiran, United States. Kanako? Ariel Weiss. United States. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our SJD, LLM, and MSL degree recipients. The candidates for a Juris Doctor degree, Joan L. Abelardo. No? Alexander Lee Abelson. Caroline Felice Ackerman. Mark Adler. Hannah Jane Ahern. Sadia Asanudin. Philip M. Awesh. Sam Raphael Alexander. John Fitzgerald Almanzar. Connor Erickson Almquist. Lauren A. Amans. Stephen I. Applebaum. Natalie Ann Arancibia. <laughs> Stephanie Margaret Arancibia. <laughs> Maria Ariadna Aritzisibal. <laughs> Tiffany M. Orosimina. <laughs> Noah B. Ashen. Naomi Babu.
Jessica L. Baker. Jason Michael Balsamo. Banerjee Shruti. Bradley Xavier, Bar Xavier Babwa. Sorry. Vincent James Joseph Anthony Barbuto. Sarah Michelle Bartelson. Christopher Beal. Theodore Edie Becker. Courtney Megan Begley. David S. Benjamin. Sarah Fariel Ben Musa. Colin Stern Barrett. Christina Kai Burgess. <laughs> Leanna R. Berkowitz. Max B. Bernstein. Max Benjamin Bessler. Diana E. Bettenker. Natalie Birnbaum. Javon Tyreek Black. Molly Blanchard Keerley. Ryan Matthew Bogatz. Robert McKeon Bogle. Omri Lee Bajko. Christian W. Bonser. This degree is conferred jointly with a Master's in Business Administration. Peter A. Bordalusi. Veronica Marie Bosco. Craig Daniel Boyle. Christopher Bodan Bojade. Joshua Brandman. Jessica Brewer. Marie Angela Brusco. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her parents, Nicholas Brusco, class of 1988, and Lucy Brusco, class of 1987. Oren T. Buckles. Jackie Aileen Burke. Danielle Calamari. <laughs> Nachman Kalko. <laughs> Catherine Ann Campbell. <laughs> Olivia Grace Chaalos. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her father, Michael Chaalos, class of 1975. Faye Bavroth Chowdhury. Emmeline C. Chen. Daniel M. Chin. Jessica I. Choi. Anne Mary Elizabeth Simonelli. James J. Cleary. This degree is conferred jointly with a Master's in Business Administration. Catherine E. Cognetti. Joshua N. Cohen.
Joshua Eddie Colon. Jonathan Gerard Coppola. Melanie Elizabeth Corbett. Juan Pablo Corden. Caroline Fletcher Corley. Taylor James Craybill. His congratulatory letter is being presented by his father, John Craybill, class of 1976. Gregory Paul Cronin. Benjamin Isaac Dash. Derek D. Daly. <laughs> Althea Lillian Daly. <laughs> Stephanie A. D'Angelo. L. B. Davis. I think there's more than one child to come across the stage over this one. Here we go. <laughs> Timothy E. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> Richard T. DeLuca, Joshua Demopoulos, Nicole Devaris Morgulis. Vanessa Evangelia Diamateris. Gregory Dong. Michelle Juliet Lakshman Dordig. Marjorie B. Dugan. Anthony Da. Stephanie Winfield Adel. Jonathan J. Edwards. Jeremy M. Exelbert. Christophe P. Fafet. Sean Fate. Matthew E. Faust. Christopher Nash Fennell. Talia Fiano. Yelena A. Fishbane. Tara J. Flanagan. Julia Caroline Fleekop. Susan Stella Formosa. Matthew J. Forzano. Anthony Thomas Freeman. Maxwell Francis Friedman. Robert Yahel Fuchs. Vincent Fuller II. Thomas H. Gabay. No? Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> All right. Okay.
Peter Wasef Gabra. Brianna Olivia Gallo. Weihua Gao. Sarah Gates. Luigi Salvatore Gaudio. Robert Galt. Josh Galenick. Joseph Alexander Rudolph Gerber. John Michael Gianuzzi. His congratulatory letter is being presented by his brother, Nicholas Gianuzzi, class of 2013. Ashley Ann Gifford. Francesca Marie Giliberti. Claire Sarah Glass. Marissa Rachel Gluck. Evan Maurice Goldstick. Jennifer Gordon. Jordan Edward Gottheim, Rithima Goyal, Guy Gerard Graney, Anika Green Watson, Morgan Ross Green, Panina Green. Lucy Rose Gubernick. Alexander E. Haberman. Maria Simone Hakim. Matthew A. Hempston. April Denise Harris. Ashley Regina Hawes. John K. Hayes. Michael P. Heffernan. Dylan Michael Helfand. John McWhorter Hendren. Julie Michelle Hendrickson. <laughs> Vin Hua. Ja Wong. Adela M. Hurtado. Jessica Audrey Hughes. Claire N. Wynn. Michael Indelicato. His congratulatory letter is being presented by his sister, Noel Indelicato, class of 2014. Samantha M. Indelicato. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her father, Mark Indelicato, cl class of 1985. Brittany Nicole Intenosha. Aaron H. Jagoda. Jessica Jang. 
Ryan Michael Jerome. Lorena Michelle Heron. Alexandra Rose Johnson. Ashley S. Johnson. Ellen Victoria Johnson. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her father, Fordham Law School Professor Nicholas Johnson. Sarah Elizabeth Johnson. Trisha Juneja. Alon Karashev. Amanda Kane. Robert Harris Kantrowitz. Caroline Ismi Keegan. Sydney Laskin Kippen. Jeremy E. Klein. Yehuda Klein. Mark E. Kleppner. Candy Cole. Sydney Traeger Corrick. Mary H. Kosecki. Carrie Kotcher. Carly A. Kugler. Keenan Kurt. Joe P. B. Kuznik, Kuzniecki. <laughs> James Robinson Lucy. This decree, degree is conferred jointly with the Masters in Business Administration. Michael F. Lambert. Danielle and Marie Lawrence. Brian J. Lee. Edward Joshua Lee. Jamie Lee. Jessica Ann Lee. Jacqueline M. Lefebvre. Jamie Nicole Lipzig. Kevin M. Lenahan Jr. Kenneth S. Leonard. Miriam M. Levy. Mucho Lee. Joshua A. Liebman, Miranda Kling Livesey, <laughs> Leslie Sungay Lim, <laughs> Xiao Shi Lu, Jen Lu, Joshua Raymond Lubriel. John Raymond Lubriel. <laughs> Jen Lu. Sharon S. Lu. Alexandra Lyon. Alan C. Mack. Laura Macro. 
Joseph G. Maligno. Stephanie Rose Manna. Jessica A. Margulis. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her grandfather, Irving Margulis, Fordham Law School Class of 1950. Biagio A. Marino. Denise Marte. Bashir Masani. Lauren M. Mastronard Mastronati. Leslie A. McAnelly, Kylie Ann McCarthy. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her father, Brian McCarthy, class of 1978. Alice Wang McKinney. Elizabeth Tweedy McMorris. Stephen Carter McNamara. Thomas E. McShane III. Edgar Mendoza. Alyssa Adele Miller. Jeremy Holden Moe. Zahar Moazami. Zahara Murdler. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her grandfather, Charles Murdler, Fordham Law School class of 1956. Susan Lynn Moskovitz. Meredith Crimmins Monroe. Sean Michael William Murray. David Aaron Myers. Jack Nagano. Mahar Najib. Tia Nandi. Natin, Andrew J. Nichols, Dennis M. Nolasco, Denise M. Nolasco, Ursula Maria Nowak, Adelise Nunez, Michael A. O'Brien. Anthony James Ordorisi. Rachel M. Orbach. Ryan F. O'Toole. Samir K. Pai. 
Allison E. Park, Simone Park, Robert G. Pollock, Malika B. Gross. Lauren Jennifer Paylor. Kathleen Ann Pierden. Yando Peralta. Elizabeth Marie Perez. Thomas L. Petriccioni. Ralph Phillip. Michael Philippu, Zipora Pill, Alexandria M. Playa, Jordan Thomas Taylor Powell, Taylor Lindsay Procofio, Natalie Janina Puzio. Brian Ramanan. Akshay Ramanan. Larson C. Randell. Danielle Angela Rapaccioli. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her mother, Donna Rapaccioli, Dean of the Fordham University Gabelli School of Business. Darren Ramsey's Ravenborg. Itai Yehuda Raz. Gabriel Joseph Reali. Kelly A. Reddington. Kai Monique Reevy. Cole R. Reniker. <laughs> Joanna Lee Reppert. James M. Rice. Anthony William Reverso. This degree is conferred jointly with the Masters in Business Administration. John J. Robertson III. Estefania Robles. Daniel J. Rowe. Ivy Betty Rook. Alexander T. Rosen. Herbert Zell Rosen. David Joel Rosenberg, Caitlin A. Ross, Brinkley T. Rowe, Julia Rosenberg, Ellen M. Ryan. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her father, Kevin Ryan, class of 1985. Luke Harding Ryan, Emily Dufel Safko, Michelle A. Sagib, Jose O. Santana, <laughs> Joseph Santangelo. Merrick Saar, Evergenia Satarov, Jonathan Shatner. His congratulatory letter is being presented by his brothers, David, class of 2013, and Jacob, class of 2014.
Kevin Schoenveld. Anna Grace Schuler. Jacob Tyler Schwartz. Samuel McAfee Scott. Giselle Sedano. Lauren Alexis Selman. Phil Sepulcre. Daisy May Sexton. Benjamin E. Shanus. This degree is conferred jointly with the Masters in Business Administration. Shrey Sharma. Jean Shin. Allison Lee Silverman. Stacy R. Serkin. Natasha Siveski. Christian Skinner Clay. Peter A. Sclaver. Constantinos V. Skordalos. Yasu. Paul A. Skydell. Elizabeth M. Slater. Ryan Thomas Slingsby. Bethany K. Smith. Alexander D. Summer. Jorge Cesar Soto. Inez Spinato. Zachary Edward Sproul. Sarah E. Sternberg. Charlotte Davenport Stewart. This degree is conferred jointly with the Masters in Business Administration. Ilana Perry Stumer. Ryan Sarajanov. Johan Sushwan. Gabrielle Sushwan. Joseph G. Tancredi. Stephen Tanico, Nicholas A. Tantone, Joseph H. Tauk, Andrew J. Taylor, Matthew Nathan Tellum, William R. Tevlin, V. D.M. Titran, Alexandra Burke Thomas, Paul Thompson, Jr. Taylor Evora Tremaine, Jeff Tsai, Marcus Olaf Tubin, Armon Turk, Princess Uchekwe. Adia Nena Uko. Carolina Vandermensbrug. Eunice Villantoy. Caitlin N. Walsh. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her mother, Lisa Esposito Walsh, class of 1985. <laughs> Kathy L. Walter. <laughs> Alyssa Noel Wanderin. 
Jessica F. Wong. Yin Yin Wang. Elaine Rochelle Wong Sijaya. Mark Eric Weinstein. John Bennett Welling. His congratulatory letter is being presented by his mother, Leo Katie Robertson, class of 1979. Alexa R. West. Alexandra N. White. Jeffrey Charles Williams. Joseph H. Williams. Trey Richard Williams. Eric Wilner. Mariana Wonder. Shayna Wood. This degree is conferred jointly with the Masters in Social Work. Laura Ann Woolley. David Allen Yearwood. Regina N. Yoon. Jackbet Yunus. Anthony John Zangrillo. <laughs> Rebecca Elise Zaret. Her congratulatory letter is being presented by her father, Fordham Law School adjunct professor David Zaret. Lauren Elena Zephron. Ling Zhu. Matthew H. Zinder. of 2017. Thank you all and congratulations. All right, before we close, let us all take a moment to thank my dear friend, Dean Nitza Milagros Escalera, her incredibly dedicated staff and the entire Fordham family who pulled together to make today such a success. Please join me in thanking them. Please remain standing and join me in welcoming Aaron Hoffman, Associate Director of Campus Ministry at Lincoln Center, to deliver our benediction. Let us turn our hearts toward God who is God of justice and God of love. God of many names, thank you for this graduating class and for all the gifts they have bestowed upon the Fordham community. We are grateful for all those who have made their journey to today possible. As our graduates prepare to embark upon the next chapter of their journey, we ask your blessing upon them. Bless them with faith in someone or something bigger than themselves who may guide them and sustain them. Bless them with courage to stand up for what is right, even if it is not always what is popular. Bless them with compassion to use their gifts and talents on behalf of those who are poor, marginalized, and oppressed. Bless them with the vision to see not only what is, but what can be. And bless them with wisdom to bring that vision to fruition. Challenge them to continue to learn and grow, multiplying their talents and sharing them generously with a world in need. Grant these graduates the grace they need to succeed on their journey and the courage to risk failure. 
and loving God, gift them with the ability to discern your presence in all things so they may come to better know and share your love through all their relationships and pursuits to come. In gratitude, love, and hope, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Let me invite you all now to join us for light refreshments next door in McGinley. And graduates, one final assignment. Please return your caps and gowns in the bins we have in the reception area. Don't forget. And now, as we begin our procession, I would kindly ask family and guests to please remain in your seats until everyone on stage and our graduates have processed out. Once again, congratulations. Thank you. 